Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us today. Alex and I just had a great conversation about things that make us feel like crap and what we've done to really fix that to make sure that we feel awesome all the time. We talk about some of our laundry rules and just house rules in general that allow us to show up the absolute best. So we hope you guys enjoy it. Make sure you subscribe and share this with a friend and we'll catch you on the inside. You just got back from a very fun trip. I did. Tell us about it. Gosh, can I even fit it into a conversation? <laughs> I don't even know. It was a blast. It was go, 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 though. I'm pretty, I'm still pretty tired, uh, but sleeping in today was helpful. And just being able to like revive myself with washing my hair, showering, getting laundry done, all that jazz. But went to Bozeman, Montana. So a few months ago, my sister had said to Alex and I, I want to go to Bozeman, Montana for my 30th. I said, count me in. I'm in. Let's do it. And so the plans kind of evolved over time, but ended up going with a group of six girls in total. So some of my sister's friends and then myself. Um, and I hadn't met actually any of the girls beforehand, but they're all incredible. It was so, so much fun. And so we get into Bozeman and on the itinerary was quite a lot of things. We had a lot of food places we wanted to go. We had fly fishing. We had horseback riding. We had skiing. We had all the all the snow things ready to go. I will say also, I was I was uninvited. No, you were invited. No, I was uninvited. It was you just said it was a six girl girl trip. And I literally have the receipts to show Alex. You can still come, but I understand if you don't want to, since it's all girls. I mean. Vibe wise, I'm just not really fit for the situation. So you were uninvited. You chose to not go. I was the most respectfully and nicely way said, probably <laughs> best for you to not go. Sam really wanted you there. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> And so we get there the first day is just kind of getting everyone into town. And we went out to eat and had some fun. Um, and then the snow started coming down. So we were actually there during a winter storm warning the whole entire time. And it was supposed to just snow nonstop. And you know what it did? Nonstop. I've never, ever seen that much snow in my entire life. But I will say it was absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous, even though there was four plus feet of snow on the ground. I There's many times that I just like looked around and I was like, this is beautiful out here. And many of you guys know, I love Colorado. We love Colorado. I love the mountains. I love just the scenery of it all. And that was very much the theme in Montana was just gorgeous scenery. And anytime we were driving places, because we were staying in Bozeman, and then we had a few activities in Big Sky, which is about an hour away. It was just even though the road conditions were a little rough, like the whole drive was just beautiful drive the whole time. Um, and so fly fishing actually got canceled due to the weather, which was a major bummer. But we did end up going snowmobiling instead, and that was a blast. Would highly recommend if you've ever wanted to go snowmobiling to do it because it was so much freaking fun. And then we went to a dude ranch and went to dinner. That was really great. It was farm to table, um, as you would imagine, in Montana. Uh, and then the next day, we went horseback riding, or were supposed to go horseback riding, and then also went skiing, which that was my first time ever skiing. And I knew it was my first time skiing, but I was you know, along for the trip, along for the ride. And then I get on the ski lift, and I, it really hits me. This is my first time skiing. <laughs> and there was no time to take a lesson. We did not start on a bunny hill. It just full sent. They were like, just hear some instructions and just go down the hill. And I fell very quickly because, you know, if you didn't know, the easy thing is going fast, which was brand new information for me. I thought the hard thing would be going fast. And I'd just be like inching down really? this hill. I, I don't know what heel. I hill heel. I don't know what I expected, but I didn't think it was going to be so easy to go so fast. You have these slippery skis, and then you are going downhill on this slippery snow, and I, you think that the hard thing is to go fast. I just I didn't realize it'd be so easy to go so fast. <laughs> like I was zooming down this hill. Yeah, like. 
zoom in. I feel like I've seen a lot of fail videos and they're all going excessively fast. Oh, and so. it is so hard to stop. <laughs> yeah. It's very hard to stop. Yeah. But I had so much fun. But I will say, and I meant to tell you about this because you have you ever been skiing before? No. Have you been like any snowboarding, no. anything? Okay. So we need to go on a ski trip, first of all. But I, the boots that you got to wear are the world's most uncomfortable thing in the whole entire world. It looks ginormous. And I put them on. And I first thought putting them on, I was going to break my foot trying to get them on my foot. Wow. And then once they were on, I had the most intense pain going through my calf. I thought I I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to stand on these skis. Are like, you sure you didn't have like the wrong size shoe? No, I had or... the, and everyone was like, oh yeah, that's how it's supposed to feel. It's supposed to be pretty uncomfortable. That makes actually no sense. Well, it's supposed to be like such a hard cast. So you don't like break an ankle. Oh yeah, that makes sense. I guess. And so they're like, when we were even driving up the hill, they, there were people walking in their ski boots and like people in the car that I'd skied before were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're walking in their ski boots. Those are so uncomfortable. And so then we go ahead and I get the ski boots on and I'm like, I can't even feel my feet. Like my cap is cramping. I'm not going to be able to ski. But after we had gone down the mountain once and maybe it was after the second time, I was like, all right, my feet feel okay. So just a spoiler alert, your calves are going to burn for like the first 30 minutes to an hour. But then it gets all right. I would imagine. I feel like it's probably just a bunch of calves and quads and glutes. Yeah. You're supposed to, I, I've got some great tips for you. You're supposed to lean forward. I could have gathered that one. Okay. Well, it's new, new information to me. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to lean forward. Um, and it's really a lot about hip movement more than anything. Could have guessed that one as well. Okay. Sounds great. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought I felt my hair falling throughout that. But. So tell me what, with those two things being groundbreaking information for you, what did you think was the... I didn't even know what to expect. You think it was a bunch I, of arms and I leaning just, back or what? I just didn't even like think it all the way through. I was just thinking it was... I don't know what I, I thought. I feel like that was kind of the, the gist of the trip. You could have just labeled it, didn't think this one all the way through. <laughs> like there was four feet of snow and you guys were like, oh, I can't believe that fly fishing is canceled. It's like, you thought you were just going to be able to fly fish in that okay. much snow? No. So I didn't think that. I was like, we need to keep, we kept calling all the places to see <laughs> if things were canceled and nobody knew how to pick up a phone. And so we kept calling fly fishing, but then on their website, they're like, we fly fish rain or snow like weather doesn't matter. We fly fish. I feel like this is a special consideration. Well, that's what I thought because I was like, this is a winter storm warning. Right. This could be different. And I was like, four feet of snow, the water's got to be frozen. How do you even wade through it? Because if you don't know with fly fishing, you have like waders on and the water's like up to like your waist or your chest while you're fly fishing. If you guys didn't know, Sue is a master fly fisher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a master baiter. <laughs> Through and through. Oh my gosh. But it was it was a blast. It was so much fun. There's just so many like new things that we did. And it was a great group to go with. And we were really great at pivoting and making decisions, which I was worried about that because going on a girls' trip, a group with six girls and girls that I did not know, I was like, this could be it's questionable. This could be rough. But everyone, like each thing that happened, someone was like, well, let's just do this and like came to a solution and did it instead of us sitting around just being like, well, we don't know what to do. And so it was really refreshing of just a lot of quick decisions being made, a lot of really good pivots and just a lot of fun. Awesome. I'm glad you had a great time. And if you didn't know, first, there's like a whole thing with Bigfoot in Montana. I don't know. I didn't really read too much into it. But the really big thing is Huckleberry. So there is Huckleberry like everything. And Huckleberry, I guess the cool thing about it is you can't farm it. It only like grows in the wild. And so you can go like huckleberry picking, but like you can't farm it. And it's like mostly in Montana. I think someone also said it was in Wyoming area. I'm not going to speak on any other states because I really do not know and do not want to spread false information. But I do know those two, those two were mentioned. And the first day, my sister got a huckleberry drink at the pub that we were at. It was a huckleberry sour. 
one of the best drinks I've ever had. Wow. It was absolutely delicious. We did indeed hunt down the Huckleberry vodka and buy it. So have some of that that we brought home. Also got some Huckleberry jam, some Huckleberry chocolate. I think some other girls might have gotten like some syrup or some honey. Um, But Huckleberry is like very similar to a blueberry. Um, And I got like a Huckleberry tequila drink later on in the week that was very delicious as well. So it was a good time. We should put a ticker up on the screen of how many times you just said Huckleberry within the last two minutes. You should put a ticker up how many times I saw the word Huckleberry while I was in Montana. It was insane. They had stickers that were all like, Huck, yeah, and pictures of Huckleberries. It was it was very of the area. Interesting. What they're known for. Also got a tattoo. I forgot about that while I was showering the other day. And I was like, what is on my arm? Because the sanderm is still there. And then I was like, oh, got a tattoo. That's right. Yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> we went to like literally from the airport to the tattoo place because it was like 15 minutes from the airport. And then we get there and the open sign's not on. And we're like, oh, no. And they didn't open for an hour. But they were like, we take walk-ins only. Like they don't really do appointments on the weekend. So Friday, Saturday, That's Sunday. That's questionable for me. For a t- I wouldn't even go to a place that only did walk-ins. Okay. So a b- little bit of backstory here. My sister was like, wouldn't it be so fun if we like got a tattoo while we're there? And I was like, I'm open to it. Do you have like an idea of a tattoo? Have you looked into tattoo parlors? Like what's the sitch? And she was like, We'll just find a place and walk in. I said, well, I'm absolutely not doing that. No way in hell am I doing that. So I but did, did it. No. Okay. I did a lot of research as far as different tattoo places in town. And this was literally rated the best of Bozeman for like 10 years in a row. And I looked up the artist. I found the artist that had the style that we wanted and went to them. And so they were like, we don't open for an hour, but you can wait outside because it's first come first serve. And we take who's first in line. And we were debating because the Airbnb finally got back to us and said we could get in early. We were like, ooh, do we leave, drop off our bags? Because we have all of our luggage with us. And we're just sitting outside this tattoo place. And we're like, ooh, should we leave and come back? And we're like, well, he said there might be a line, so we don't know. Sure enough, like within 30 minutes, people just start coming and waiting in line. And there was like a line of like five to 10 people behind us by the time that they opened. And so we got in and this guy, was so quick with tattooing. So we told him both what we wanted. He drew it up and then showed them both. We approved it. And then I literally looked at the time because I wanted to gauge how long hers was going to take so we could like really plan out how things were going to go. He started that tattoo at 1220 and finished it at 1228. Wow. And did shading on it. And like it looked so good. And he's like, oh, yeah, I've been tattooing for X amount of time. He's like, I'm actually going to Costa Rica next re- week to tattoo for like three days and come back. And so he killed it. He was cool. super fast. He was super nice. Got us in and out. And it was fun. We so have a nice tatted. little fun, fun memory. Yeah. So that was my weekend. What was yours? <laughs> <laughs> Mine was significantly different. I worked uh, almost all day, Saturday and Sunday, took care of Tucker did all kinds of laundry dishes. My parents came into town. So uh, action packed in a different way than yours. Yeah. My parents, uh, since I was out of town, my mom knew that he was not going to have his uh, cook. And so she decided to step in for that and (laughs) drop off copious amounts of food for Alex to eat. Every day. It was very helpful. (laughs) Just wanted to make sure you were fed. Yeah. It was also one of the first times we'd really been apart from each other. Which was was so sad. I missed you. Yeah. As we do everything together almost every day. Even Well, we say that, but when we're working, like I don't really see you during the workday. Uh, I don't really see you between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. for the most part. Like we'll see each other in passing more so than anything, but we don't like see each other a whole lot. And spend time together. Like we might be in meetings together or slacking back and forth, but we're not like having quality marriage time together, uh, which that made me feel a little bit crappy to be away from you. It was sad. I was very happy to see you when we got back. But I thought today we could talk about how to not feel like crap all the time. I feel like a lot of our clients and just people I talk to, you know, in life, everyday life, talk about how they just feel bad a lot of the times. And so I thought we could dive into some things that you can do or things that you're doing that are making you feel like crap all of the time, and then be able to give you some answers on how to not feel like crap all the time. Because who wants to feel that way? Not me. I don't. 
What are some things that come to mind that make you feel like crap? The first one that comes to mind is going to be spending far too much time at my desk. I think that as we grew up, it was something where I had to get my work done before I could do, go do fun stuff and go play with my friends or what have you. And so I would just sit there with my homework and just stare at it until I was done or I was done studying or what have you. And so I feel like that has carried into my adult life. And so then now I'm in a position, or I, I fall into this from time to time where I just sit and stare at my screen because I know I have more to do and it just continues to elongate the time that I'm sitting there. And so then I find myself in this situation where I'm getting like a fourth of what I should be getting done, done, but I'm like, I'm still sitting here. I'm just trying so hard, but my mind is somewhere else. And really all I needed to do was get up and get outside and get some steps in and move my body, get some circulation and, and those different factors rather than just continuing to sit there. So I would say that feeling crappy is not getting <laughs> enough sunlight, not getting movement outside and, and those different factors. I find that to be huge for me, um, especially when I just have long days. Like I could just sit at my desk for hours on end and uh, be glued to my computer screen. But I know that that is literally when I feel my absolute worst. And we were just talking about this in regards to you picking up um, and doing a lot of the stuff with Tucker while I was gone of you got a lot more movement and you were forced to get outside a lot more. So how did that impact you over the weekend of just I you were forced to move and be outside more? I slept like a baby because uh, I, I had to. Um, it was about double the amount of steps that I was getting on a day to day basis. And so that was a, a challenge. I think that I got less done than I normally do, of course, because I was just spending less time at my desk as a whole. But when I was at my desk, I was much more focused and I was able to get more done in the time frame that I was sitting there relative to me sitting at my desk for many more hours than I are on a regular day. And with that, I, I found myself in a situation where it was much more enjoyable to get a little bit less done and, and have those steps outside and that activity over getting maybe 10% more done, but really not feeling great at the end of the day. Because when I have those type of days, my mind is exhausted, but my gosh, my body is like, bro, we still need, we need something to do. Like we need to move our body. We need to sweat a little bit. We need to do something because uh, I'll get to bed and my brain will be completely fried. But then my body is still sitting there like, yo, we didn't get any attention today. Like this is, I need something here. So um, yeah, it was a big shift. Do you think that you actually got less done or you just felt like because you weren't as at your desk as much that you got less done? I think I'm a little bit of a special case here where I truly did not get yeah, the you, same amount of stuff done. You have a very heavy schedule and you had to add in a lot of things while I was out of town. I was genuinely curious of how you felt on that. Uh, but I love what you noted of saying like it balanced out of you would rather get that 10% less done and feel better overall. And I think that's really showing up for yourself and your mental health and your health as a whole, because then you can do more days in a row than getting into a place where maybe you get that 10% done, you go to sleep, you don't have a good night of sleep, and then you end up the next day already starting the day behind because you're not feeling as good. Um, and then it can kind of be a slippery slope from there. Right. What's the first thing that comes to mind for you? I would say, especially from this trip, there's a few things that I really prioritized. And it was interesting because all these girls on the trip, again, they I hadn't met them. They hadn't met me. They might have just known me from being Sam's sister or from following me on social media. And so there were things that I really recognized. Not only did I plan to prioritize them, but it was very obvious of what I was prioritizing, especially in comparison to other people. And since I am around you a lot or around Miguel and we're in kind of like our space doing our thing, I'm around clients and coaches, then I forget what it looks like in the everyday world. And so a few of the things that I really prioritized were getting in enough protein, getting in enough water, 
and eating enough food more than anything because I knew it would be very easy to go on this trip and possibly eat just once a day or end up just eating a bunch of junk. And so I prioritized that by packing some food. I packed some like protein bars, like Nash bars, some other snacks like midday squares. Um, and then I had my pancakes that I eat each morning and I prepared those in advance. And then I had a few meals that were vacuum sealed and ready to go and I took those with me. And I took those just as a backup of, hey, if I don't get in enough food, I have a plan for myself. And so took my water bottle to ensure I got in enough water, made sure I got that filled up throughout it. And even if that meant having to stop to pee a few different times, I really ensured that I always had my water bottle on me and I was always getting in water because also I knew even though it was the winter, Montana is a more dry climate. And so I really wanted to prioritize getting in water plus travel and sleeping in a different place, I knew water was going to be huge. And then when it came to protein, I was thinking through of, okay, if I have my pancakes in the morning um, and we, I knew that we were going to stop by the grocery store, so I was still going to have my bacon as well, uh, that I was going to be able to get in like 30 to 40 grams of protein in the morning, and that was going to set me up well. And then when we went to the grocery, I also grabbed some of those Chobani shakes that I really like and found a new flavor, which was very exciting. And I knew that I could grab and go for that if I needed like 20 grams of protein. But anytime we left the house, I always had at least a Nash bar on me. Um, and then I had a few other like snacks in my pockets and in my bags. And I had them just literally everywhere. Uh, and I actually didn't end up eating as much of my prepped food because when we went out, I did still prioritize those things of I like the first place we went out, I got a burger and it was a bison burger. So I knew it was going to be a little bit leaner and I was able to eat that and get a good amount of protein in. Um, and then when we went out to eat the other places, I got things like I we had a bison some another night. And then I ended up getting like grilled chicken sandwiches or just grilled chicken when I went places because it wasn't that, oh, I just have to eat grilled chicken because I want to get protein in and this is the only thing to eat. It was truthfully of reflecting and looking and realizing, hey, if I eat this heavier meal, I'm not going to feel great throughout the day. And I do want to prioritize how I feel. I know I'm out of schedule. I'm out of routine. I also know that my digestion can be finicky, not only with travel, but not having as much privacy. So what is going to be the easiest way for me to feel my best and perform my best? And so I would just get like grilled chicken sandwiches. And if you don't know, now you know. I love friends fries. I actually love all types of potatoes. I really do not, you know, I don't discriminate as a whole. I will eat potatoes. And so I was able to eat like grilled chicken with fries. And that was like, that was great for me. Like I enjoyed what I was eating and I was able to really prioritize protein, water intake and eating enough food and even made sure like everyone around me, just because we were also doing a lot of activity of like, hey, let's make sure we're eating enough food because we would start our plans for the day and I'd be like, all right, when are we stopping to eat? Because otherwise some of you girls aren't going to eat until dinner time, and we need to make sure that we're at least having a stop for someone to grab something to eat. So I felt really positive about that, and I ended up being in a really good spot food-wise and just how I felt because of those things as far as pre-planning as well. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Do you track macros while you're traveling? No, but untracked does not mean unpacked. That is a line that I came up with on the fly in a check-in last week, and I felt really good about it. <laughs> but I, with not tracking during this trip, I know a lot of people would make the association of, oh, since I'm not tracking, I don't need to prepare anything. But this is something I really hammer into clients if they're transitioning to intuitive eating or we're taking time away from tracking or they're going on a trip. Like just because you're not tracking doesn't mean that you're not 
preparing some things in advance where even when we went on a trip uh, for like just the two of us and we had decided we're not bringing food to pack at all, we still brought like some snacks and some miscellaneous things because we knew it would help us feel our best. And so each trip is going to need something different from you of how you need to show up and what food. And like when we went to Vegas, all we brought were like protein bars and some snacks. Uh, But like with going on this trip, I did prepare some food and have that. And again, I didn't end up eating all of it, but I'd rather have it and not need it than not have it and need it and was able to go about the days and feel good with not having to pull out my phone or worry about what I was eating because I was focusing on like these core non-negotiables of what was important to me and like my digestion was important to me and feeling my best was important to me. And I made decisions based on that and was able to enjoy things. And even my sister had made a comment as we were driving home home of saying that like she felt like I like ate with everyone at everything that we did and it was really great for me to be able to do that and just be able to be so present with everyone and not have any worry about food because I did a little bit of preparation and some of that even came down to like the food places we ate is that going into it we didn't have like an itinerary of we're going to eat at all of these places we only had like the dude ranch nailed down and so I ended up like looking up some places to eat and going through and there was a few other girls that had like some dietary needs on the trip and I was able to know going into the place that we were eating that I had an option to eat and so they were like deciding between two places I looked at the menu and I was like I'll push the vote over to this place because I know I can get this meal at this place. Um, And that was an easy way that I could show up for myself without tracking, but just by being able to do a little bit of preparation, looking at some of the menus, thinking through what the trip was going to include as a whole and be in a really positive spot because of it. Do you want to expand a little bit on the digestion component and how you prioritize and optimize that for travel? Because I think that is a really hard bit for a lot of people as they're traveling to manage their digestion to their best ability. Yeah, I have lots of travel tips when it comes to digestion. Uh, Number one was starting off before the travel even started. So I knew that I was going to have an early flight, and this is where I used to shoot myself in the foot for so long, is that I would finish eating my meals at my normal time. And then travel days or the day before travel, I always end up going to sleep late because I'm packing and all that. So I get less sleep. I just finished my last meal not too long before, and then also So getting up really early and then switching time zones, like there's a lot to go into it. So it starts the day or two before travel. And for me, I had an alarm set on my phone. I told Alex, I'm like, I'm eating my last meal of the day at like 4 or 5 p.m. And I stuck hard and fast to that. And that really helped because I had a 5 a.m. flight. So I was like, if I do have a bowel movement before this flight, then I'm able to have 12 hours since I finished my meal and hopefully be able to have some good sleep in there. Now, I didn't have great sleep, but I was able to be in a positive spot that I wasn't waking up feeling like there was like a rock in my stomach of this food that wasn't digested yet. And I didn't feel uncomfortable going to the airport, which I always used to hate of feeling like this this stress even going into travel of I know that I'm not going to feel good. And I feel like a lot of the days I'm going into travel, like even though I might not feel 100%, I feel pretty dang close to that or feel overall in a better spot than I have in the past. So some of that was starting the day before of making sure I finish my meals by a certain time and getting to bed by a certain time. And then increasing my water intake the day before travel and the day of travel is very, very helpful, as well as lowering my fiber intakes slightly. So being able to allow things to just move a little bit easier through my body, not be stopping as much. So lowering my fiber intake the day before and the day of travel, um, as well as lowering caffeine intake the day before and of travel. And I know that's difficult because you have early mornings or late nights or just travel days are exhausting in general. And I will say continuously, like my go-to is just having some decaf coffee because it gives me the effect and the routine of having coffee 
coffee or going even half-calf. And then also having that water in place was really helpful. So that's what set me up going into the trip. But then I also took some of my supplements. I didn't take all the bottles. I just put some of them into two baggies. And I was like, this is what I need. And so I took magnesium and I took fish oil, which I knew were going to be really important for me. Then I also took turmeric because I knew that we were going to be doing some extreme stuff and I might need some anti-inflammatories as well as I knew it would help with my gut. Uh, and then uh, other supplements weren't necessarily um, digestion related. I did take a digest um, digestive uh, enzyme with me as well because I didn't know exactly the whole situation for food. So I had those in tow with me and just keeping regular with my supplements helped me with my digestion and the supplements I have in place for digestion. Um, I knew that it was going to be helpful in that regard. And then doing some of the things from the digestion podcast of just chewing slowly, being mindful as I'm eating, not scarfing down food, not getting too hungry. All of those things are a big part of it. But even like bringing my travel squatty potty was so, so helpful to have. The toilets were a little bit high. And so that helped me have a bowel movement. I woke up early one day and it was great because it was just peaceful. I was able to have some time to myself in the bathroom because I, I knew it was going to be a crazy day. So I didn't want to like wake up too late, not have time to go to the bathroom and feel bad all day. So I woke up a little early, had some time to myself, was able to feel good throughout the whole day. And like not any part of the trip was I sitting there being like my stomach is in pain. Um, and even like vocalizing, like a lot of the people on the trip knew that I either had dietary restrictions or had like a sensitive stomach. And so there was a time where I felt a little bit uncomfortable. And I just texted my sister because I had just like walked out of the room. I was like, I feel okay just taking some time for myself so I can feel my best. I'll be back soon. And so it wasn't like I was going to hear them from the other room being like, where did Sue go? And then start stressing about what I'm doing. Um, and I just took some time to stretch, do some yoga moves, calm down. And then I went back to everyone and felt great. And so just being able to like look out for myself of instead of being like, I should just stay in this environment and feel bad of like, I just took 15 minutes for myself and I was able to be in a much better better headspace and feel so much better going into and like enjoying everything. Um, and then the other thing was not having things that I know hurt my stomach. So we were out to eat and the, a lot of the food they got had stuff like dairy in it. And I've been trying, um, dairy doesn't sit well with me. And I've been trying to be very strict about not having dairy to see if my skin clears up as well as to see if my digestion feels better. And there were times that they got food that I wanted to eat, but I knew it had dairy in it. And I had told them like, hey, I have a dairy allergy. You guys go ahead and get that. I'm just not going to be consuming it. And even like at the dude ranch, they had brought out um, desserts because it was my sister's birthday. And they were like pizookies and they looked so good. And and they were like, Sue, come on, have a bite. And not in a way that they were trying to like sway me. I was just like, hey, that has dairy in it. I, I'm not going to eat it. And that was like one very simple thing I could do for myself of not having that so I could feel my best. So all of those combined allowed me to really do what I needed to do to feel my best and for my digestion to do what it needed to do to feel its best. So those would be like my top travel tri tips or at least for this trip specifically, what I did to ensure that my digestion was in the best spot. Cool. I think that the coming back to you speaking on eating too little, I find myself in that situation. I feel obviously very crappy when I am eating too little. I think that that's more commonly my issue. And I think that this is common in the sense that people are not eating much throughout the day and then they're eating copious amounts of things in the evening that probably don't align with their digestion to begin with. And then they're eating it extremely fast because they're starving. And so that's one of those situations that I always encourage people who are very busy with their work, very busy with running around with their kids, of trying to at least have small meals throughout the day or something that's going to allow for them to not get to that point in the evening where they're just ravenous and having to eat whatever is the closest thing to them because they're going to die if they don't eat right that second type situation. And so I think that under consumption of calories is maybe just as common as overconsumption of, of calories as a whole for the individual who is just go, go, go every day. Yeah. And that's, I mentioned of just 
talking to the girls and being like, hey, have you guys even eaten today? Because if we're going to go and ski for four hours, like you're going to need some substance in you. And so it wasn't overwhelming for me. And all of them were very receptive of me just asking. And sometimes all you need is a little nudge of like, hey, have have you eaten anything? And even like in the airport when we got delayed on the way back, uh, my sister had gotten sliders and she was like, I know I need food. And then we were um, she was saying like, I'm not going to get anything else. I'm just going to have a drink. And I was like, well, we're about to get on a four hour flight where you're not going to have anything to eat. And then we're going to have to drive home from the airport. Like, and it's going to be a whole thing where you're not going to get food. So we need to eat before we get on the plane again. And she had said like, well, I already had those sliders. And I was like, well, that was the only thing you ate all day. She was like, okay, you're right. Let's go ahead and get a real meal. And so it was just like a super easy conversation to have with her and for her to feel so much better going into travel and just getting home because that's the freaking worst when you have been at the airport for way too long. You've had no food but snacks. And I know you and I can fall into this when we're like, I do not want to eat another snack. I just want a full meal. But then you're like, I don't want to eat at the airport because I'm almost home or I'm almost to my destination. Um, so it's good to just have that little nudge from someone who cares about you of like, hey, let's make sure like we get food in today and we'll be in a better spot because of it. And going into another thing that makes me feel like crap are two things that are very closely related are not managing my stress and not prioritizing sleep. And being able to, or when those go unmanaged or unchecked, I notice it first and foremost of just, I feel like absolute crap. And I'm going to keep taking lessons from this trip. Like one way that I showed up for my stress throughout this trip was like doing some pre-planning, was looking at menus because I was anxious going into the trip of just I don't know what it's all going to be like and I could have let my head run away from that. But the way that I managed my stress was what's going to make me feel better? And I asked myself that question and then I did those things. And even one of the things that was going to make me feel better was writing out a schedule. And did we follow that schedule perfectly? No, but it gave me some peace of mind of just writing out the schedule, seeing what times things were going to be at and allowing me to see like, hey, I don't need to stress about it. I have it all written down. It's all on paper. We're good to go from here. Uh, And then with sleep, like I told the girls of like one night they were going to go out and I said like, hey, you guys go have fun, but I I need to get to sleep because I woke up really early this morning. And if I'm going to do everything else that we're doing on this trip, I need to go to sleep right now. And I was very proud of myself because it would have been very easy just to say yes the whole time. But that was one thing where it was, hey, I know that if I do not get this sleep now, I'm going to feel awful the rest of this trip. And I was able to just say, I need to go to sleep right now and go and do that thing for myself so that I could really do what was best for me. I think that with managing stress and on the topic of of this trip, individuals find themselves in a situation where they're worried about what they should be doing for work or what they should be doing at home or what's happening at home type situation. And so they are not being present where their feet are. And so they find themselves in a situation where they're adding unnecessary stress because they're worrying about things that have nothing to do with them at the immediate moment type situation. And they would enjoy their their trip or enjoy the environment that they're in if they just focused on where they're at. And so I think that that's one thing that a lot of people run into when managing stress as a whole, as well as by having that plan, it eliminates a lot of the unknown, even though you guys didn't follow it to a T, it puts you in a situation where you at least have an understanding of what's coming next. I think that some individuals can fly by the seat of their pants and not be too worried about it. It's just the way of life. It's your sister is that way where she is, (laughs) she, you know, she could do with a plan. She could do without, it doesn't really matter. She's going to go with the flow. It's not going to throw off her day a whole lot. I and and you are, are not like that at all. And so it's much better for us to just have a plan or an idea of what's going to happen that day so that preparation wise and mentality wise, you can be in a, a headspace to take whatever's on the horizon on. 
Yeah. And I feel like a big part of that is also communicating before those types of trips so that you can leave it where it is and be where your feet are. So I had made like information of things for Tucker of just being like, this is what needs to be done. And then it was like off my plate of it's going to get done. I know Alex is going to execute it and I don't have to sit here and wonder about it. Did you 100% maybe need that list? Maybe not, but I needed it for my peace of mind of just, I have everything done, then that's how I can leave and be confident of everything's going to get done. And with work of just vocalizing to clients, this is the situation, vocalizing to our staff, finishing all of my work beforehand, and then being able to log off and feel comfortable logging off uh, for doing so. So a lot of it comes back to just pre-planning a little bit of looking ahead and seeing what could come up and how can I make space for that or show up for myself in that moment. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Any other things that come to mind that make you feel like crap? I would say the communication that you briefly touched on. I think that being able to communicate your needs and and what's on your mind, communicating ideas that you have and those different factors. I think that by not communicating and staying more quiet in situations where you probably should speak up puts you in a place where you feel pretty crappy because you're in your own head of, well, my ideas or my desires or my wants are not valuable enough for them to be taken seriously. And you may feel under, misunderstood because no one is doing what's in your head, but no one knows what's in your head. And you, you are- can't mind read? <laughs> it's not It's not on the list. Oh no. my God, this whole, t- our whole marriage, I thought you could just read what's on my mind. No, I've, I've gotten pretty good at reading your mind. Yeah, <laughs> that is, but that takes a ton of repetitions. We're in year five of, of being married and um, we've spent, way more hours than the normal yes, married couple has, has spent together. So I got a little bit of an expedited course <laughs> on my reading for you. But in general, that's not the case. And so a lot of times without that communication, you are creating a, a narrative and a, a dialogue in your own mind that is very defeating. And so in that, even if I, I think that oftentimes the fear of speaking up is looking stupid or asking a dumb question or something along those lines to alter what you're thinking in your head is what people think of you. You don't want to change that. You you have this, you have this kind of high regard of what others around you think of you probably. And you don't want to alter that with a miscue or misspeak of things. And Oftentimes, when you actually start to vocalize these different factors, this is this is I, I'm speaking on this so vividly because this is my mind. This is this is something I have worked on for years now, and I've gotten tremendously better in the last I would say in the last six months more than Thank anything. Um, and so, when you start to bring those ideas to the table, people are are more appreciative, and you realize that some of those frustrations that had just consumed your mind because no one understood is all gone because you just spoke up. You just said what you needed to say or you needed like your, your thoughts and those different factors. I think it's very important to just vocalize how you feel. I think that Bert Kreischer is someone who I admire in this sense. He does not care at all what anyone thinks of what he brings to the table. Stupid, intelligent, it doesn't matter. He's just gonna blurt out what comes to his mind. He has such a level of blind confidence that I hope to have some level of at some point in my life. And so I feel like his friends and those different factors speak on that and he will just blurt out five terrible things. And all of a sudden the sixth thing that he blurts out is amazing. And they're like, where did that even come from? That's not even the same thing. And so just, you know, it, people are not paying as much attention as what you think they are. And they're not keeping tabs on every word that you speak as much as you think they are. And so just being vocal and having that communication will have you not feeling crappy. I cannot agree with this more. And especially within our dynamic of we are around each other a lot. We do spend more time together than the average couple in a way that I would think oh, Alex knows that because he knows that I said this thing a week before. So 
tit for tat, he knows that this is how I'm feeling. And there will be times where I'm like, why is he not doing this? And then it's like, oh, maybe he was also living his own life and doing his own things and didn't sit there and analyze every single thing that I said. And I just needed to say it. I need to speak up about what I wanted, what I needed, or what was going to help me in that moment. And that's allowed me so much clarity because, again, the amount of time we spend together, I don't spend that amount of time with anyone else in my life. So how could I expect them to like know those things about me unless I say it? It is the, I, I have, you know, I wouldn't say I have regret because it's something I was unaware of, you know, when the time I've, I've lost friendships or, or have, um, lost relationships with other individuals that I, in hindsight, realized that communication was like the main, th if we communicated on the issue or whatever caused the rift better, then there probably would still be a relationship that's there. And that's the most interesting thing because I've, I've realized that that narrative that's always built from the other person's perspective is oftentimes misjudged where it's fabricated of, it probably started with a root of, of truth, but then the more time that goes without the communication or without the, um, dialogue between the individuals, they find themselves in a place where that little bit of truth turns into this very fabricated situation. And so that's always one thing that I'm like, man, I just, it could have just been a little bit of communication. <laughs> just speak up, use your words. There's been times where I've expressed to Alex of like what my thought process was when we like do have a little riff and I'm like, well, I did this and I expected this or whatever. And Alex will sometimes be like, how did your mind get from point A to point B? And it's a narrative that I'm building due to how I perceive your like responses or reactions. And we've gotten so much better at like, maybe I say, and I'm like, well, you responded this way or you act this way. And you're like, I was busy. Like I wasn't upset. I was just responding quickly. And I didn't have like the same type of response. And we give each other a lot more grace and understanding because we know that there's another side to the story. And there is a different perception or a different narrative that the other person is under and allows us to get so much more on the same page and not have crappy situations literally come up all the time just due to an inability to communicate what we want or need. That would be another thing. Give people grace. Yeah. Not everyone is out to get you. <laughs> you don't need to think that every not responded to text or missed call or whatever the situation is post on Instagram. It's not about you probably. <laughs> and if it is like that person's probably needs to grow up and have a conversation with you. And so I think that giving people grace of situations that you're building a narrative in your head of like, oh my gosh, this person hasn't reached out to me in forever. We're definitely not friends anymore. It's like, that's just not how that works. Like as adults, I think that that's something that's carried out from childhood, teenage years, all For those sure. different factors, because especially at that time, that's probably what that meant. Like missing a text was a a big F you sent your way of like, I actually don't like you anymore. <laughs> we are not friends. And now as an adult, it's like, that's not how this works because we're all very busy. We all have our own lives. We have work. We have, uh, some of us have children, all those different factors. And so you have to take these things into consideration and it m gives you such a better peace of mind. Oh, because for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You're making all these narratives in your head that are, you're, you're fabricating these things as well as putting yourself in a situation where where you're being consumed by things that are made up. You're literally making up these scenarios and they may all be not true. And then you have this huge sign of relief, sigh of relief when you actually do maybe speak to that person and they're like, oh, dude, my mom was sick. I, following that, I got in this crazy work project and I'm just now, I apologize, but I'm just now getting back to you. I, I'm so sorry. And then you feel like an absolute idiot. And you have to like get rid of all this resentment that you've already built and you're just like, well, that was very valid, but I've been upset this whole time yeah. and it, for no reason. Yes. And I think that in our line of work where we've been able to have so much correspondence with so many different humans from different walks of life, from all, I mean, so different age, age levels, all those different factors, we've had an opportunity to kind of expedite our communication 
because of these different things that we've been able to see and be introduced to and these circumstances that we've been put into, I think that that's been a huge help to be able to see these different things and to allow for much more grace and understanding. Because once you find this positioning in which you're giving a, a lot of grace, there are going to be moments where you're burnt. And it immediately makes you feel like, damn it, I should have thought they, they were going to burn me. I should have been more aware and I should have kept that same narrative in my head because I was right. And it's like, that was only one situation of probably a hundred or more that that was the case. And getting yourself into that situation where it is still the best situation, even though you were just burnt, it's still best to lend as much grace as possible because those other 99 situations you were, it was the right thing to do. It's just this one and it's been recent, if you will, and that it stings a little bit more, but that will dissipate. You'll have another 99 that are great and then be in a good spot. And it just circles back to no one's paying as much as much attention as you think they are, or at least like the, the people that I'm surrounded by aren't making like, um, What's that, what are they called? Like not subtweets, but that's another word for it. But like people aren't like posting things on Instagram to make you feel a certain way. Like I can promise you there's not been a time in the past like two or three years, probably longer, but I know for certain in the past two or three years that I've purposely posted something to make someone feel bad or to elicit a certain reaction from someone that that's not been the case at all. But there have been situations where people have assumed that or been like, well, you posted this and I thought it was about me. And it's like, freaking wasn't. But I mean, you weren't able to communicate with me or to give me some grace for who I am as a human being to recognize like I'm not going to maliciously do that to you. And I think that also comes to another thing that makes me feel crappy, which is not taking time to reflect or audit myself. And that's a huge thing I've learned in the past five years, especially being in a relationship, a marriage, is that there's things that you're doing wrong. And you got some inner work to do and you've got to look inward. And it's been a really rewarding experience to self-audit as much as I have, where before I really didn't want to like look under the rug, so to speak. I didn't want to see what was under the hood. I didn't want to see where I was wrong. I just wanted to point the finger. And that came from not having enough self-awareness to recognize the finger should have been pointing at myself. And that has allowed me so much joy in my life just to see, hey, you made a mistake here. It's not the end of the world. You're not the worst person ever. You don't suck. Not all these other things you tell yourself. It's you made a mistake. Now learn from it. Now grow from it. Now go apologize and let that person know how you feel because you didn't, you made the mistake and you need to now speak up because of it. You're trading short-term comfort for long-term growth. And that is a very hard exchange, especially if it's in a situation or in a relationship that you have very consistently opted for the short-term relief over that growth because it it it's it's gets scarier and scarier to make the leap to the growth the more decisions that you make for the short-term comfort. And so if you've got a lot of relationships that you're like, man, I've been, I've been doing this for 10, 12, 15 years, your parents, maybe childhood friends, those different factors. And so making that leap gets more and more challenging. And so it's, and, and I think that the, the weight that's lifted off of your shoulders when you do take that leap to the growth is a relief that is so heavy. And, and it makes you almost feel weightless in those situations. And so making that decision is, is a strong one, very difficult, very difficult to say the, just to get the ball rolling, mm -hmm. but it's, it's much more worth it. And it puts relationships in your life that are so much more strong and you can 100% be yourself because you're not trying to, to maintain a, a narrative or a look that you are just not you. And so by, by doing that, it's it's a huge, huge win. Yeah. I mean, it's it's given me like everything positive in my life by taking time to self-reflect and self-audit and see where I can improve. Are there things that other people in my life can do? For sure. For sure, for sure, for sure. But are there still things I can do? 
Yes. And that's a thing with like control of I used to feel like I needed like control of my life, but then I wasn't taking time to look at anything in my life or plan anything in my life. And it's like, I feel so much peace because I know each day, like I'm taking a step towards like being the person I want to be, being the boss I want to be, the significant other, the daughter, like whatever that may be, I'm, I'm being that person truly to my core. And I'm not sitting around like carrying that heavy weight of like trying to be or do something that I'm not. I am authentically me. I am very like I come to a lot of people like on my my knees showing them like here's all my flaws. Like not just take it or leave it, but like here's my flaws. I'm sorry. I'm working to improve them. And that I don't think you need to apologize. Well, I, I'm more so in in regards of like this I, I I see the flaw or I see the mistake that has been made. Like I see it and I recognize it and I'm changing because of it kind of thing. And like that's given me everything positive in my life are having those conversations and doing that work, that inner work. I will say one of the core rules for our house, and this will be something that will make you feel crappy if you don't do it, is that this rule is – if you're going to complain, you've got to fix it. And if you're not going to fix it, you can't complain. So I'll give you an example. If Sue seasons my food differently than I want, I am not going to complain because guess what? I do not want to fix it. And her delicious food with maybe just a little bit of the wrong seasoning is much better than any of the food that I would make for myself. Thus, no reason to complain. But you may find yourself in a situation where you're constantly complaining and you have no actual tactical way that you're going to fix these complaints. You just want to hear yourself talk and talk in circles. You should avoid that. That makes you feel crappy. You should stop doing that as soon as humanly possible. And every time that you have a complaint, it always needs to be followed with, this is what my plan is to improve this. This is what my plan is to remove this out of my life so that you can get out of the complaining. Now, I do think that there is a time and a place to where it's just, I need to get this out. I need to have someone to talk to. But when this becomes repetitive and this becomes a norm of every single night, you're sitting down with your spouse and being like, oh, I cannot believe this happened again at work today. <laughs> and this happened again. And Becky was terrible. I cannot believe that she's still doing this. You got to make some changes. Now, I know some of the things you can't change everything. There are some situations where you're just going to have to deal with it. And that's the reality of life. Not everyone is going to be super happy and hunky dory every day and everything is perfect. There are some things that we just have to deal with. But when you find yourself complaining about a situation, being able to zoom out and say, what can I do to change this or what can I do to improve the situation is a much more uplifting way of going about it. And it also puts you in a much better headspace than the defeat of just complaining, period. Yeah. I mean, mic drop as a whole. I The moment I like remember so vividly is back in 2020 when shows were getting canceled and I was in peak week and my show got canceled. And I was very unhappy and I was uh, emotional and sad and I just wanted to complain. And you gave me space to like complain and be angry. And at the end of it, you said like, you're allowed to feel all of that. It's all very valid. And normally you have 24 hours to get over something, but right now you get 72 hours. After that, we're moving on. And like that sticks out so clearly because like 2020 was such a transformative year for the both of us, our business, for a lot of things. And like that moment just will always stick out in my head because it was the moment like that rule like really solidified for me of like if I just sit around complaining and being upset that this happened – what is that going to get me? It's going to get me absolutely nowhere. It's going to drive my husband insane. I'm going to be a negative Nancy to everyone in my life. And people aren't going to want to freaking talk to me because I'm just so negative. And I'm only going to see why life happened to me and poor old Sue and your show got canceled and you worked so hard for it. <laughs> you know what? 
there's nothing to do about it, but move on. And that was such a valuable lesson for me to learn. And it was even something I was talking about this weekend of like, I don't surround myself with people that complain constantly where people can complain, of course, around me and vent and have their space. But if they're consistent complainers, I don't allow space for that in my life because you're not trying to change. And I only want people that are wanting to change their lives for the better. And I love that we have that rule and I love that we can call each other on it and we can make comments and not offend the other person of like, if you're complaining about something and you haven't done, then I'll bring it up. I'll be like, then do something about it. And you're not like yelling back at me. You're like, you're right. I should go do something about it or I should shut shut up. (laughs) So I absolutely love that we have that rule. It's impacted me in so many positive ways and just shown me that you don't need to sit and dwell on things. And that's also helped with so much of my life of just not sitting and complaining of just pick up and say, what's the next step from here? Because I really realized it wasn't going to get me anywhere to sit and complain. That probably takes us into another thing where environment is going to play a large role in you feeling crappy or not feeling crappy. And I think that when we bring this to the table, maybe some individuals immediately go to, I don't, I live in this small apartment. I don't have a whole lot of of finances to change my environment. I'm stuck at a job that I don't like. But I think that this is something where you're still creating the environment. It's not just simply the physical things that are there. You are needing to regulate what you're consuming and how you're consuming these things because the emotion of other individuals around you can be absorbed or it can be kind of reflected or deflected. Mm -hmm. It can go different ways. And you have to be understanding of that if you're going to be in an environment from a work perspective where you've got coworkers around you that it's just not a good environment. Like march to the beat of your own drum, stick to your task, stay in your cubicle, stay in your space and just hunker down. Like you don't have to engage in every conversation that's around you type situation. And when we talk about like environment of your home or or your vehicle or what have you, it's like, I want a better, I want a better car. I want a better apartment. I want a better home but take care of the things that you do have. Like take really great care of, clean the things, keep everything really nice around you. You're gonna like the space a whole lot more, I promise you. I can promise you that. I can assure you because I myself have been a little bit of a clean environment freak for a little bit of time. And I have enjoyed everywhere we've lived. I've enjoyed my college apartment, even though there wasn't a whole lot there, it was it was good. Like it was an environment that I could do what I needed to do in it. And I made it what it needed to be. And that was just, I've just progressively done that over time. And I, the, the, the rent slash the mortgage has gone up in those places. I've gone to nicer places in that time frame, but my, oh, my approach to these different environments is no different. It's the exact same because I know what is actually making the environment itself, because this home is the nicest home I've ever lived in. But I assure you, if I did not take care of it like we do, I would not like it and be like, there's a better spot for me. Like if I had, if I had a better place, I would take better care of it. And if I had this and if I had blah, 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 I'd do better with it. And that's just not true. So environment. (laughs) And you do this when your office does get, or my office definitely gets messy, but just using the example of if your office gets a little cluttered and messy, like the first thing you do when you're like, I can't handle this as you clean it up. You might you might change the location of things <laughs> around a little bit, but like you do it to really give yourself that environment you know you thrive in. And even like getting home last night after a 16 plus hour travel day, what did I do? I took time to unpack my suitcases, put stuff in the laundry, I didn't start it because I was not going to stay up to move it over. And you guys know our laundry rule. I'm not doing that. Uh, And then the main floor, there were just some things I wanted picked up so I could start the week on a good note. And I stayed up a little bit longer to clean up the space, make it what I needed to be so that I could feel better and have a better environment. And I knew that anyone would understand me just going to bed and leaving that. But I knew that if I wanted the environment, 
I needed to take the step and do it. And that's exactly what I did to allow myself to not feel crappy is I made the environment better. And whether that's the people you're surrounding yourself or the cleanliness or how you take care of your things or whatever it may be, it's literally looking and realizing you have a lot more power in your life than you think you do. And that's one of the things I mentioned is feeling like life just happens to you. And I cannot connect to someone who lives life that way because let me tell you, a lot has freaking happened to me this year, but I have not played the victim in it. Each and everything, it's how do I take the next step forward? How do I improve this circumstance? How do I see the good in this circumstance? Because if I let that circumstance happen to me, I become that circumstance. I become complaining about that circumstance. I stay in that circumstance. And I think we've talked about it before when we've talked about mental health of oftentimes I don't talk publicly about some of the things that are happening or that I'm going through. And it's because I got to deal with my shit first, and I'm going to take time to clean up that environment, whatever that may be, whatever the situation may be, and then put it in a box and put it away instead of airing it out, complaining about it, it constantly being the topic. It's It happened. The next step had to happen, and now it's just moving on forward. To come back to our laundry rule is that you are committing to doing the wash, the dry, and the fold. fold. Once you start that washer, <laughs> there is no break in that. And if the you break that rule- The wash does not stay overnight. The dryer does not stay overnight or even for a few hours. You're getting those clothes out and they're clean clothes and they're going to be folded. Because no one wants some wrinkly, freshly dried, clean clothes because that is the worst. And they're not clean. Then you got to wash them again. You got to throw them back in the wash. And then you just got this- vicious cycle of, I just wash the same load of laundry three times because I'm too lazy to just take them out of the dryer. <laughs> and then your laundry room looks like a mountain of clothes. And then you look in your closet and you're like, I have nothing to wear. And all these are wrinkled. And so I don't want to wear them. And you walk into your laundry room. It's like, here's all my clothes. <laughs> and so, and, and you'll, you're going to save money doing this. This is the beautiful thing because we have bought such less clothes since we kept this rule in place, because I'm realizing like, damn, I, I like my clothes. Like I, I've got a good base of clothes that I wear consistently that I really enjoy. There's no reason for me to buy more clothes because I got what I, I like. But more often than not, I'm in a, like previously, because we'd have so much laundry. So much. We would literally go through all of our clothes and even the clothes that it's like, ah, I don't like love these, but I'll still wear it like in public. We'd go through all of that all of it would be dirty. And then we'd be looking in our closet like, we need some new clothes. And then we'd buy new clothes. And then it was just like, well, I didn't really need these. And so now we've been in a place where we can get rid of those fringe clothes that are like, eh, I don't really like wearing this, but I will in a, in a pinch. Like we don't need those clothes anymore because we take better care of the clothes that we really like. And so you'll save money by doing it. That's the most yeah. fascinating thing. Well, we literally, our last house, our laundry room was in like the basement and it was in this like really cold, dark room. And it was like a whole thing. And it was, we were really bad with laundry. We didn't have rules in place for it. It was just what it was. And like Alex said, we would just go through all of our clothes and have none. And so we made that rule coming to this house. And we found that we were since we were washing our clothes regularly, we would have like a whole section of our closet that we just hadn't touched because we were like, we don't actually like wearing those clothes. They don't actually fit us. They're those fringe clothes. And we were seeing like, oh, these are washed. I'm going to, of course, wear this because I like wearing this more. And so we were able to clean out clutter of our closets and give us like better space and environment to work with. And then we also have a better environment of the laundry room altogether of, I know I'm not going to walk in and pick something out of the dryer and it be a wrinkled mess. I know that like if if the laundry is going and I didn't start it, Alex is getting it taken care of and he knows the same for me. And we are just always gonna hold each other accountable in that of we got clean clothes. Right, and, and I think that as partners, it's something that holding each other accountable is a really important thing. And unfortunately for many couples, I feel like that that accountability is frowned upon. Like they feel like they're getting nagged at or they are being picked on or what have you. And I think that that certainly can be the case. It, it is 
all in the delivery as well as the understanding for the person who's receiving. And so by having the open communication and being willing to kind of fight through that nagging feeling that the person's receiving and being like, that's not what I'm doing. This I know makes you feel better. It strengthens our relationship. It, it is good for the routine of the home and those different aspects. Like I'm not nagging you. It's just a matter of, I know this is good. And once you get to that place, that was, it kind of like unlocked a new level for us to be able to hold each other accountable in these different situations, whether that be within our fitness, whether that be within our nutrition, chores around the house, whatever the situation is, we're able to hold each other more accountable naturally and it not be something that is taken negatively out of context. Yes. And one part of that is that we will vocalize, I would like to be held accountable for X so that someone isn't overstepping. But even in that, what I do want to say is we sometimes still get irritated with each other because it's hard to be confronted with something you know you should be doing and aren't doing. And there have been times where maybe I'm trying to think of a, an example of like, I say, I haven't been outside all day. And Alex is like, maybe you should go on a walk. And I'm like, maybe you should go on a walk because I'm irritated that I hadn't already done it. And that's something where like, there's still irritation there, but it's more of a resistance to recognizing you're not doing what you said you were going to do or what you wanted to do. And so we have that understanding, but sometimes we'll still quit back at each other because we're irritated. <laughs> well, it's more of you're expressing the frustration that you have with yourself. It's not yeah. even that you're frustrated with the other person. You're more frustrated with yourself that you haven't already done it. Like the, yes. this, the conversation that's happening shouldn't even be happening because I should have already done this. And I'm more frustrated with this. I'm not frustrated that you brought it up. This is just how it's being outwardly expressed. Yeah. And so that's one big thing. But um, as we wrap up today, I think that as you guys are listening to this, you may have been able to identify four, five, maybe six things Ten. <laughs> <laughs> that you're wanting to work on. And I want to drive home to you that take one of the things and let these things build momentum. Because as you heard us talk through, a lot of these build upon one another, they impact one another. And so by taking some of the bigger rocks or some of the things that really stick out to you that we talked about today, start there and then allow for those to kind of mold you into the other factors to really get into the best situation to where you are never feeling like crap. <laughs> Yeah, because we definitely didn't do this all at once. This was years of stacking habits and figuring out what what was making us feel like crap and then taking action to not feel like crap. So take them one at a time, take them half at a time if you need to, to truly commit to them and get them done. Because it doesn't help anyone for you to say, I'm going to do them all at once because I'm going to tell you you're going to fail. And that's not going to help your progress or anyone around around you. So take something, be realistic with yourself and make that change. Maybe it is not getting in enough protein and maybe you're only getting 40 grams of protein in a day. Aim for 50, aim for 60. Don't aim for 150. Like literally take the step that you need to take to show up and to not feel like crap so that you feel like crap less and less every day. And then you're just freaking feeling awesome all the time, which is where we all want to be. And you're not striving for perfection. You are striving to have more good days and having less bad days and then putting yourself in a situation where the streak of good days is really long. And then you may have a very infrequent day where you miss these things or, or, or categorizing as a bad day or what have you. So try to think of it in that sense and try not to miss two days in a row. If you do make a mistake, let yourself, it's okay. We're gonna move on and, and hit it the next day. So. If you guys have not already, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. If you want to leave us a comment and you're watching on YouTube, please do that as well. We love you guys. Thank you for listening today. We'll see you in the next episode.